Hi, I'm Steel City 321 PB, welcoming you to my channel where Hobby Vintage Radio is a way of life. <laughs> Here on my bench is uh, an Echo model AD75 that was introduced onto the British radio and television market during early 1940. a lot on the long way band these days. A froth of lace. <laughs> Where does that come from? I think I've always liked dressing up. BBC I I Radio up 4. And then I just need to... Now over to uh, medium wave. There's not a whole lot around this side of the dial on medium wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andre Beers, she nicked that one as well. That's another example of it, the creative sector getting support there. They enjoy the health of the country. You see, that's the It's picking up interference from uh, the lights and uh, there is a switch mode power supply operating downstairs. It all contributes to uh, the interference. Though this uh, model works quite well, it was uh, very much a no frills radio. It did not come with uh, a dial light and there was no glass or perspex covering the uh, dial. It is also what is technically known as a short receiver. It does not incorporate audio preamplification. The demodulated signal is fed directly onto grid one of the audio output valve. It is an AM receiver designed for long wave and medium wave reception. It is also an AC-DC model. That means one side of the 240 volt mains is strapped directly down to deck. Something to be very much aware of when contemplating working on AC-DC valve radios or any other type of valve radio since direct contact with the mains input can uh, most certainly be uh, lethal. If this uh, vintage radio intrigues you, please make yourself comfortable in your uh, favourite chair and I will begin the narrative of how this radio was transformed from being dull, uninteresting and uh, non-functional to the clean, tidy and uh, functional radio you see just here. Something has torn through the... Uh, speaker cloth which I say is close on to being threadbare and that object has continued on through the speaker cone. I can insert my uh, small finger through the cloth and the cone. The dial is somewhat wavy. Hopefully I'll be able to cure that particular defect. During the production run of this model of radio, such commodities like perspex and glass were required for the war effort, hence no glass or perspex cover over the dial. See here a heat related crack on top of this cabinet. I remember seeing those on this particular model during the early 1970s when the odd one or two came into the workshop for repair. So 
very likely that heat crack has been there for uh, several decades. Turning this gem round so you can uh, see the back cover. It is immediately obvious the top screw is uh, missing. I have uh, scores of 6BA screws so finding a replacement will not pose a difficulty. What is also obvious, the back cover is cracked close to the top. And you may not see this but there is a burn crack just here. The ballast or dropper resistors have been overheating at some time. One can guess the reason for that. I suspect the rectifier will have been overworked due to electrolytic reservoir and smoothing capacitors being electrically and or physically leaking. We shall probably see in due course. Right chaps. Whilst the back cover is facing the, the camera, I'll loosen the screws and remove it so you can see it internally. It certainly is not without a bit of dust. <laughs> the chassis looks as though it has been fitted with a little grey uh, carpet. Or a sprinkling of grey snow has uh, settled everywhere. <laughs> My darling wife, bless her, will uh, vacuum clean the dust out of this radio in minutes. Being a registered asthmatic I have to avoid dust especially after it has been disturbed since it can very easily trigger an attack. It is a four valve including rectifier super heterodyne for long wave and medium wave uh, reception. Its valve complement starting from the front end and uh, working towards the rear is CCH35, triode hexode frequency changer, EF39, Verimu RF pentode, CBL31, double diode audio output pentode and uh, CY31, half wave rectifier. Not only has the speaker got a damaged cone, its basket is uh, riddled with surface rust. Hopefully I'll uh, cure all of that. Every likelihood at least one of the top two dropper resistor sections is uh, OC. There is a strong possibility both dropper resistor sections uh, are OC. <laughs> They not only serve as the mains voltage adjustment, um, before 1963 here in the UK mains voltages ranged from 200 to 240 volts AC. There were a few areas that were served with DC mains which was one of the prime reasons non-mains transformer radios like this one were manufactured. I will not be surprised if this dropper section reads OC. Radio chaps, I'll get wifey to vacuum clean the dust from the inside of this radio then I'll remove the chassis so you can see how the components are arranged on its underside. My darling wife has effected a super job dusting this uh, radio chassis. <laughs> Looking over this chassis, now it is out of its cabinet, the area on this uh, left hand corner is uh, giving me some concern. This uh, molten wax residue and there is a fair amount of it has likely trickled out of uh, this smoothing choke. Perhaps something shorted or partially shorted or broke down under load. 
therefore causing excessive current draw. Purely for uh, interest sake I'll apply my analogue multimeter probes onto the terminals either side of the choke winding or um, coil. This smoothing choke does read as uh, defective. There is a possibility that one or both of the electrolytic capacitors, there are two housed inside this um, aluminium canister, an 8 microfarad and a 16 microfarad at 450 volts DC working, are leaking some measure of DC volts down to deck. Conversely, the excessive current draw, if indeed it is due to an excessive current draw, might be due to defective components elsewhere inside this radio. There is also another possibility, though less likely. This smoothing choke simply killed over and died, as I imply. Highly unlikely, but I have known it happen. I'll now go on to test the DC resistance of this smoothing choke with my digital Evo multimeter. All I'm getting are a spurious range of numbers on its display which suggests not only might I be charging something up, there is no DC resistance to be read. It uh, kind of confirms that smoothing choke winding is OC. Since I have my uh, digital multimeter close to hand, I'll check the strength of uh, this fuse. Since it reads fine, I'll now check the resistance value of the uh, top two dropper resistors. I'll uh, remove this uh, rectifier valve from its base. Before I do any testing I will uh, just shine up with this warding file a few areas on these contacts where I can place my uh, multimeter probes. More or less 110 homes.
105 ohms. Hmm. The top two dropper resistors are uh, reading fine. Right. Whilst I'm uh, testing uh, resistances, I'll uh, do so for the bottom resistor. Uh, 690 ohms. Hmm. No doubt that is the heater ballast resistor. The entire dropper resistor is reading fine, which is very welcome news. <laughs> I'll uh, need to locate a suitable replacement smoothing choke. Oh dear. <laughs> In the meantime, I'll uh, turn this chassis around. So you can see it from the uh, front. Housed inside this uh, Aluminium canister are the two already mentioned electrolytic reservoir and smoothing capacitors. They will definitely be replaced. Slow motion tuning is achieved via this uh, epicyclic drive mechanism and uh, a wax coated paper and foil capacitor has been getting somewhat hot at some time. It's uh, surrounded with uh, molten wax residue. That's on the surface of this chassis. For sure it too will be replaced as will all the foil and paper capacitors as well as electrolytic capacitors also. These uh, Connecting wires that go between the audio output transformer and the uh, loudspeaker are replacement. Likely the rubber sheathing on the original connecting wires had perished, similar to how it has perished on these uh, grid cap connecting wires. There are a few rust spots dotted around this chassis. I'll uh, deal with those when I uh, clean it up. I'll now flip this radio chassis over so you can see the component arrangement on uh, the underside. Being uh, of point to point wiring or rat's nest arrangement the rubber sheath wires are in better condition when compared to those on the top side. A number of the uh, carbon composite resistors um, will have uh, shifted off tolerance. They, along with all the paper and foil capacitors, will be uh, replaced. I uh, remember capacitors like the ones you uh, see here, being electrically leaky as far back as the late 1960s. Very likely they had been in such a condition well before that time. Surprisingly I don't see any bulges at the uh, connector's end of the electrolytic reservoir and uh, smoothing capacitor canister. I'll uh, disconnect it when I fit new replacement electrolytic capacitors, but I'll leave the old canister in place so as to cover up 
what would be a gaping uh, hole if I uh, removed it. On first inspection, I'll be uh, bold to say, this underside component arrangement looks totally original. It does not appear to have had any service work done to it. It's as from being new. I'm almost forgetting to mention. It is a good idea to have the tunier capacitor vanes meshed when uh, working on the chassis. They can easily bend if knocked and it is also a good idea to remove all the valves, especially those with top cap connection. It is so easy to damage them if the uh, chassis is resting on the top cap connection of a tall valve like this uh, CBL31 for example. So from what we saw on the top side of this chassis and what we observe on its underside it would be immensely folly to connect unchecked and unrestored valve radios like this one into an AC supply conducive to operating condition. Be aware at all times valve equipment operates with high voltages. If there is any doubt consult a known bona fide technician before thinking about working on vintage valve equipment. If you are following along and continue to do so throughout this particular radio restoration series, you do so at your own risk. Be aware, electricity kills. Looking at this uh, dynamic loudspeaker in some detail, it's, and it was manufactured by uh, Goodman's Industries, Wembley, Middlesex, here in England. Its basket bears a lot of surface rust and its cone bears a hole from uh, where some object has penetrated through the uh, speaker cloth just here and uh, continued through the uh, paper cone. This uh, baffle board will receive replacement cloth. The uh, screws have been cleaned up. They were very rusty. The nuts now rotate freely. The baffle board, of course, is uh, will come second. The speaker comes first. <laughs> the paper cone, of course, will be repaired. Despite there being a small defect at uh, this part of the uh, paper cone hinge, it will also receive attention. The voice coil is uh, not greater in or rubbing against the centre magnet. I'm immensely encouraged by that. I've uh, a reasonably good uh, feeling about this loudspeaker. There's no reason at present why it cannot be cleaned to a decent standard. Before concluding uh, Part 1, we will take a preliminary peek at the circuit diagram. You see here a fairly conventional designed circuit diagram for a short radio receiver. I'll just uh, move it up a little bit. 
Now you may not be able to uh, read this very well, but here goes. Release dates and original prices. January 1940, £7.07 shillings increased July 1940 to £7.17 shillings and sixpence. October 1946, £11.11 .11 shillings plus purchase tax £2.00. Nine and eightpence. The price of this radio, of course, that's what we read here, was in early 1940 seven guineas. That was seven pounds and seven shillings, or seven pounds thirty five pence in decimal coinage, which, as prices for radios those days go, was very reasonable. From what we read here, it was probably priced too cheap since the price was increased some six months on in that year to seven pounds seventeen shillings and sixpence or seven pounds seventy eight pence in decimal coinage. I do not know what the production run was for the Echo AD75, but we read the price was further increased some six years on in 1946 to 11 guineas or 11 pounds 55 in decimal coinage plus two pounds nine and eight pence, nine and eight pence sorry, <laughs> purchase tax. I am not familiar with purchase tax as was, but in decimal coinage it is, in this instance, £2.48. So, from uh, some guineas in 1940, this model of radio was retailing from October 1946 at £14.08 and and in pre-decimal coinage, or £14.04 and and in uh, decimal coinage. <laughs> it almost doubled in price throughout the years of uh, World War II. It was uh, superseded in the line of what is now termed as round echo radios by the model A22, but I'll deal with that in another Radio Restoration Series. Right. One more quick look at the circuit diagram. Uh, as well as the um, component tables. This one here is for the uh, capacitors. And these two here, that one is for the resistors and this one here is for the uh, coils etc. It's a view of the underside of the chassis. view of the top side of the chassis. And uh, back to the circuit diagram. You can uh, freeze frame at any time should you wish to look at a deeper level at the circuit diagram. How was the electronic version of this radio circuit diagram. My idea is to uh, use from now on paper copies only if they are available in my folders otherwise it is electronic versions. Please let me know in the comments section 
below. <laughs> I uh, thank you for viewing part one. Your time and interest is always appreciated. Please join me again for part two when I'll be cleaning a completely uh, stripped chassis and uh, beginning the rebuilding process. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel I invite you to uh, do so. Until next time, goodbye and uh, God bless.